Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. I don't know if you knew this, but anyone can get the same premium wireless for $15 a month plan that I've been enjoying. It's not just for celebrities. So do like I did and have one of your assistant's assistants switch you to Mint Mobile today. I'm told it's super easy to do at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three-month plan equivalent to $15 per month required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See full terms at mintmobile.com. This last weekend, a bunch of radio producers piled into a small silver Mazda and drove off to the hills outside Nestziona. The star of the ride was three-year-old Eliana, the daughter of Yochai Metal, our senior producer. But the person who brought us on the trip was reporter Daniel Estrin. You'll be hearing from him in just a moment. We were off to do some field reporting, like actual field reporting, in search of Israel's national flower, the kalanit, or anemone. I checked the site this morning, and um, f- there's a fresh report on... Uh, Anemones, which is exciting because it's like actually a little early for them, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, these are like the very first anemones that are blooming. Every winter, tens of thousands of Israelis do exactly what we were doing: go out to the country to see carpets of floppy red anemones at the peak of their bloom. It's still a bit early in the season, but if you're a diehard flower fan, you can go online for live updates on flower sightings around the country. The sites have breaking news style tickers and scrolling updates. That's how Daniel heard about these ones. Anyway, we arrived, took a few steps, and immediately began spotting little red flowers. Eliana was very excited. Wow, these are gorgeous. They're just... This one is beautiful. It's quite a bit of kolaniot here, actually. We weren't alone. One woman with a big, fancy camera was taking close-up shots of the red beauties. A few people, I kid you not, had set up lawn chairs in front of a couple of flowers. Sophie Shore, one of our producers, ran into a big group of kids walking with their parents. She asked whether they were picking the flowers. We shouldn't pick flowers because they're forbidden. Oh no, they all answered in chorus. A soliktof. You're not allowed to pick. Hey, I'm Ishi Harman, and from PRX, this is Israel Story. Israel Story is produced together with Tablet Magazine, and at the very start of the anemone season here in Israel, our episode today, Sacred Plants. We have two stories, two very different stories, in two very different places, about man's relationship to plants. Act 1, Flower Power. There's one public service campaign that began more than 50 years ago and is still going strong today. It's widely considered by Israeli copywriters and advertising execs to be the most successful campaign in Israel's history. The campaign to get Israelis to stop picking wildflowers. Daniel Estrin tells us this triumphant story. Back in the old days, years ago, everyone in Israel picked wildflowers. Take one typical Israeli of that generation, 77-year-old Israela Hargil. 77 and a half. (laughs) Born 38, 1938. (laughs) You can't get much more Israeli than being called Israela. And when she was young, Israela was just like the next Israeli. She loved picking wildflowers. When she was 17 in 1955, she went on a field trip with kids from her kibbutz. We were in the Galil, the northern part of Israel. And at dusk, we settled down, and I wandered around with a friend and saw from a distance a beautiful field full of flowers, light purple flowers, quite tall. They were irises, and we started picking them up. Both of us, huge bunches of these flowers, very happy, walking further and further. All of a sudden, one of us looked around and saw a sign, quite a big sign, saying, Hagvul 
Lefanecha. The border is in front of you. The Syrian border. We were behind the sign. You would actually cross the border? Yes, yeah. that's what happened. That's Israela's daughter, Tali, sitting on the couch next to her mom. You know how a kid gets to flowers? It is really enchanting. So we picked more and more, and there is a beautiful one, and there is a tall one, further and further, until we saw that sign. You went into enemy territory to pick your flowers. That's right. it. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what happened. <laughs> Wildflowers meant a lot to Israela. As a little girl back in Poland, she used to go flower picking with her parents. Then World War II broke out. She survived the Holocaust hiding in a Polish family's home, where she would take cover under the bed whenever visitors came by. Going out to pick flowers was out of the question. It was just way too dangerous. But at night, the Polish family would let her go outside to breathe some fresh air. And there, behind a fence and a gate, just out of her reach, was a garden with flowers. She called it the Enchanted Garden. After the war ended, she moved to Israel, where she could pick as many flowers as she liked. And picking flowers in Israel felt symbolic, not just to her, to her peers too, and also to Tali, her daughter. You were in awe when you saw these uh, colorful flowers. And it was an emblem or a symbol of of the... re. Creation of Re, the, yeah, of the rebirth, state. Rebirth. 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 Of, of the, the country, of, of, of everything. Of the state of Israel. I mean, a Jewish country. And it was kind of proof that things are going well, you know. Now I think it was a reflection of, of our state of mind, in a way. I remember mainly one morning, very early, I walked up Tali. She was about four, maybe five. She didn't want to get up. It was too early. It was around five o'clock in the morning. But I said, Talinka, you must get up. We are going out. Well, she got up. We dressed. Why did I want her at that time to get up so early? because I wanted her to see the sunrise. Well, we got up quickly and went out on a hill, and we sat there quietly watching the sunrise. And then we noticed that the whole hill was covered with wild flowers. White and bluish and, of course, greenery. Well, so we started, especially Tali, started picking up the flowers. She picked them up and brought to me, and I was sitting there, and started weaving, weaving. weaving a crown. Now, I knew how to weave a crown from the early childhood in Poland. It means I took a long piece of grass, which was quite strong, and tied these flowers up until we managed to have a wheel which will fit her little head. And, and every birthday I had a crown like every that. Every birthday. Every birthday. Every, every single birthday, birthday, a crown of wild flowers. This was not just their private ritual. In the country's early years, picking wildflowers was a national pastime. It was a way Israelis showed their love of the land. It reminded them of the flowers mentioned in the Bible. They would uproot the flowers to feel rooted to their homeland. Christian pilgrims were into wildflowers too. They would buy albums full of pressed petals as souvenirs from the Holy Land. Benny Fierst, who works at Israel's Ministry of Environmental Protection, has done a lot of research about this. Nobody thought that there is a problem. Nobody thought that, hey, guys, if all of us will keep on picking flowers, 
there might be no left here, some uh, flowers for the next generation. And there was no thinking about, and about environmental protection or nature uh, values protection. Nothing. Let's pick as much as we can. There were songs about it. And everybody said, the people, even the government, promoted the Israeli education system to do it more and more. There was a, there was a competition between uh, primary schools all over Israel for 20 years, from the 1950s until the 1970s. Those who picked as much as they could, the, the most, uh, many, many flowers as they could, they got a prize from the Ministry of Education. It's unbelievable. But there was one man who did realize there was a problem. Uzi Paz. He's a wildflower expert, one of Israel's top wildflower experts. He lives in Ramat Gan, a suburb of Tel Aviv. When I showed up at his house, I walked through a beautiful garden in the front yard. But inside, there wasn't a single vase of flowers. I asked his wife, half-jokingly, if he ever brings her flowers. Absolutely not, she answered, dead serious. Right after I arrived, Uzi whisked me into his office, where his desktop computer is jam-packed with flowers. Folders and subfolders and sub-subfolders, all full of photos of gorgeous fields of wildflowers, organized according to location. Back in the 60s, Uzi helped found Israel's Society for the Protection of Nature, a chevra la'aganata teva in Hebrew. And he likes to think of himself as the man who saved Israel's wildflowers from extinction. Well, he, together with a few other key people, he acknowledges. They realized that if people kept picking Israel's flowers at the rate they were picking them, they would simply disappear. So they launched a campaign, the campaign to save Israel's wildflowers. Step one, convince the government to make it illegal. The way Uzi remembers that campaign sounds a lot like an episode of House of Cards, political wheeling and dealing to convince key lawmakers to support the legislation. He talks about sheepishly approaching Moshe Dayan, then Israel's minister of agriculture, who, Uzi says, looked at him with his single eye and told him he was nuts to think the parliament, the Knesset, would ever outlaw flower picking. But then, just as Uzi was leaving his office with his tail between his legs, Dayan said, OK, give it a try. It was all very time-sensitive. The Knesset was about to go on recess. And in those days, if you didn't pass legislation before the break, you had to start from scratch once the parliament adjourned. Plus, there was talk of new elections in the air. So Uzi was afraid it was now or never. He rushed to lobby the head of a key parliamentary committee who just happened to be an old friend of his. The man had a crappy car, so Uzi used to give him a lift to the Knesset. He says that helped seal the deal. And in August 1963, wildflower picking was made illegal. But given its popularity, a law was not going to be enough. So Uzi brought in the country's leading advertising executives and asked them to come up with their best ideas for a public service campaign. One suggested putting the message on matchboxes. Meh, Uzi thought. Another suggested advertisements at the movie theater before the film started. He didn't like that much either. Then one day, on a trip to Haifa, Uzi noticed some posters the mayor had printed, telling people to protect the flowers of Haifa. That was it, he decided on the spot. Posters. He printed 30,000 colorful posters with sketches of protected wildflowers and a simple message, protect the wildflowers. The posters were distributed all across the country. They were pretty and large, and people hung them everywhere, in government buildings, in health clinics, in banks, a classic propaganda campaign. Everywhere, in, the, in army bases... In uh, post office uh, branches, in schools, especially in schools, all over. That's Benny Fierst again from the Ministry of Environmental Protection. It was a hit. It was, everybody, it, there was a black market even for those posters. People stole it from schools and from other places because it was very, very popular. It was very nice. Yes. A black market? What did they want to do with them? Black, because the, the quantity of those uh, posters was very limited. 
Every school, let's say primary school or high school, got only five posters to put at school. But kids wanted more. So they stole it from the walls and brought it home. Before long, everyone joined the party. The Israeli lottery printed lottery tickets with images of protected wildflowers. A gift manufacturer made a wildflower-themed card game. Newspapers ran a weekly column called Flower of the Week. Environmentalists even complained to Nomi Shemer, Israel's most famous songstress, about one of her tunes that was all about going out into the fields to pick flowers. So she changed the lyrics from 1,000 cyclamen flowers everyone gathered to 1,000 cyclamen flowers everyone counted. And if that wasn't enough, Shema wrote another song called Waltz for the Protection of the Flora. Remember Israela and her daughter Tali from the beginning of the story? This song was sort of the soundtrack to Tali's childhood. That I remember a lot you know, on the radio a lot, and we used to sing the song, you know, when we were in the scouts and uh, going on trips, on the bus, we used to sing the song, and it said, you know, explicitly, you can't pick that flower, you can't pick that flower. I don't remember the words exactly. You're not allowed to pick. And uh, everybody loved that song. All these things just to show you how popular was these things. Suddenly the Israelis in the 1960s discovered the, their wildflowers. They understood that it's better for them to uh, enjoy the flowers on the posters, and keep them in the ground, not in their um, vase, not in at home, and not picking them. It's astonishing just how successful this campaign was. In the decades since, there have been plenty of public service campaigns in Israel to get people to change their behavior. There are radio ads every single hour telling Israelis to drive safely, and still they don't. There have been campaigns to get people to stop littering so much, to stop smoking so much. Israelis still litter. Israelis still smoke. But no one picks wildflowers. Why was this campaign so successful when so many other campaigns in Israel have not been as successful? Mm, that's the best question, I think. Um, well, we need to understand. Uh, the wildflower campaign was very unique. It was the first one. Up until the early 60s and the wildflower campaign, all the other campaigns were about the military. Join the Navy, join the Air Force. This was the first major public campaign asking Israelis to change their habits. And you know, for, for primary things, Rishoni, something which is in the beginning, has its own power. And one more thing we need to, to say. It's the, the basic thing that the, the campaign asked from the Israelis was very uh, simple. It says, you like the flowers? Great. Keep on liking them and love them. But just don't, just do it in a different way. It's amazing. It's, 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 it's an iconic campaign, we must say. It changed the Israeli behavior and the Israeli ethics of people to their land. Oh, that's a small one, right? I got it on it. Yeah, it's just tiny. A baby, baby kalanit. Out on our field trip near Nest Siona, three-year-old Eliana already knows the drill. Should we pick it? Yochai asks her. Eliana replies, no, you're not allowed to pick. It's been more than half a century since Israel outlawed wildflower picking. Today, for Eliana, for everyone here really, you just don't do it. Ma 
Daniel Esther, and thanks to Laura Rossbrau Telem. Quality sleep is essential for boosting energy, recovery, and well being. So take your sleep to the next level with Sleep Number. With a Sleep Number smart bed, you can individualize your comfort level and enjoy a better sleep night after night. J.D. Power ranks Sleep Number number one in customer satisfaction with mattresses purchased in-store. And now, during Sleep Number's President's Day sale, save 50% on the Sleep Number limited edition smart bed, plus special financing for a limited time. For J.D. Power 2023 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Only at Sleep Number stores or sleepnumber.com. See store for details. Our next story is about a very different kind of sacred plant, an actually sacred plant. It takes place far away from the anemones of Nestziona, but its beginning was right here, in the north of Israel, with this guy, Sergei Baranov. When we moved to Israel, we lived in the north, kind of hilly terrain, and uh, that was one of my habits, just to look for scorpions and snakes under the rocks, turning the rocks, looking for those guys. And I had a few of them, brought them back in, into my house and kept them in a jar. And I was feeding them every day, um, grasshoppers, which my father didn't like, of course, and I had to release them. By the time Nathan Ehrlich met him, a lot had changed in Sergei's life, to begin with his home country. But I'll let Nathan tell you all about that, and about how it is that they came to meet and how they bonded over a plant. Act two, where the wild things grow. I am on a porch overlooking a lake in a forest. Before me is a friendly, mild-looking man in his mid-forties. He's boiling cactus in a giant propane fuel cauldron, taking large puffs of mapacho, pure tobacco leaf cigarettes, and blowing the smoke into the pot, muttering healing words as the smoke and steam come together. The other retreat participants begin to arrive, and we form a circle at the edge of the lake around a large drum. They are an eclectic bunch made up of different ages, nationalities, and coming from different life circumstances. But all of us have come here for one purpose. Let's tune in, let's be quiet, silence, and let's allow for silence now. Not talking yet. For the next three days, we are going to drink large quantities of Wachuma, or San Pedro, a psychedelic healing cactus from Peru. Even though this is probably my 30th ceremony, I pretend to be calm. But I am not. Not even close. I like to present myself to the world as a laid-back, relaxed person, but it's a terrible lie. A coping strategy. Because I'm actually the opposite. A bald, neurotic, anxious, self-hating Jew. When I drink this stuff, I'm like Larry David on steroids, or LSD. But yet, here I am, scared silly. Why do I do things like this? Travel to the Peruvian countryside to seek out this medicine? It's a good question. And it's more of a story than an answer. One that begins in high school when I was punching my friend and he was punching me back. It was not a fight. It was a game. A game called Dead Arms. Dead Arms is where you punch your hopefully smaller opponent in the tricep muscle, alternating turns until one of you taps out. My friend was bigger. The next day he was showing off the damage he had inflicted on me to our classmates. It was etched into my arm in deep, intricate blacks and blues. There were oohs and ahs, and all my peers were laughing. But when I got home, and my father, who was a doctor, saw the wounds, he responded not with laughter, but with alarm. Yes, anyone who gets punched in the arm by their bigger friend will be bruised, but these bruises were ominous, so big they appeared cartoonish. And that's because we found out the next morning I had a lethally low platelet count. And that's because we learned by the afternoon... I had leukemia. In the weeks and months that followed, I had substantial doses of chemo and radiation to eviscerate my bone marrow and make room for a transplant for my brother. I vomited into pink plastic buckets five to ten times a day for a hundred days, and in this painful ordeal, my life was both spared and condemned. On the one hand, AML leukemia is something many people don't survive, succumbing to either the disease itself or the toxic treatment. 
And on the other hand, there are people who struggle through the treatment and emerge largely unscathed. And then there is the rest of us who are stuck somewhere in the middle. And we, the scathed cancer survivors, we suffer in the in-betweens with vague undiagnosable symptoms that doctors and therapists, even those who specialize in the late effects of cancer, write off as the complaints of crackpot hypochondriacs. You can find us, tens of thousands of us, maybe hundreds of thousands of us, maybe millions, on discussion boards and listservs trying to figure out and help each other figure out how we can heal when the toxins we received continue to wreak havoc in ways that even many of the most accomplished doctors can't help. We are like the mythical Greek centaur Chiron, who was shot by Hercules' poison-tipped arrow. Chiron survived the shot, but was destined to live the rest of his eternal life with tainted blood. He was a healer and was dubbed the wounded healer, an archetype, a repeating motif in the unconscious of the human soul that exemplifies how those who have suffered in life and have somehow managed to emerge from their suffering are the most powerful healers, because it is they who can best teach others how to emerge from theirs. Over the course of a decade, I got through the treatment, healed the initial side effects, and built my immune system back up. But then came the late side effects. After telling the various doctors I would see about how I was falling asleep in journalism school and on trains to and from work, winding up at the end of the line in Bronx or Coney Island, or that I didn't take a shit once for nine days, they pronounced to me as though they had just solved a murder case, Nathan, you have chronic fatigue syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. And I would say, no shit. That's what I literally just told you. You just gave me a fancy name for it. It was at this point that I turned my back on Western medicine and started collecting healers of all stripes. Hypnotists, acupuncturists, biofeedback specialists, bioenergetics, tai chi, Chinese herbalists, craniosacral practitioners, ayurvedists, nutritionists, physical therapists, yogis, chiropractors, homeopaths, dream analysts, and a wonderful therapist. All part of my path that would eventually lead me to Peru and to this lake, and Sergei. And Sergei is... I'll let him describe it. Sergei, I wanted to ask you, um, sure. what do you call yourself? Are you a shaman? <laughs> no, I'm not a shaman. I'm a recovering Jew. When I first met Sergei, I thought he was a Peruvian shaman. And he kind of is, but he comes in a Ukrainian Jewish package, which was shocking. It was pretty wild to travel as far as Peru to have a one-of-a-kind cultural healing experience and meet a shaman who fled the same part of the world as my great-grandparents, and for the same reasons. How is the recording voice now? Because this is the voice I, I will talk. Like, that's, that's good, no? Sounds Just good. kind of... All right, let's roll. Well, my name is Sergey Baranov. I'm originally from Ukraine. We were hated. When you're hated, you're not living in peace. In Kimelnitsky, Sergei would get beat up in the street. Just coming on the street saying, are you a Jew? Yes. Here's your fist in your face. His parents were excluded from the higher-paying jobs, so they did what many Jews from the Soviet Union did. They moved to Israel. Well, that's kind of ironic, uh, because when we went to Israel, we were told that we were going home. You know, it's a Jewish country, now you're going home, and no more persecution, no more hatred. So what happened then, when we came to Israel, uh, we became Russians, and the local population didn't accept us. We said, well, well, we are Jews. We came to our homeland. No, it's our homeland. You get out here. So same thing began, same absolute thing like I had in the childhood. No, same thing began in Israel. Just kind of like a bad movie, you know. It's like you're watching a bad movie once again. Sergei never felt welcomed in Israel, so he moved, first to California, where he was duped into a cult, and then to Mexico, where he met peyote shamans, and then finally to Peru. That's it, I got my ticket, and I went, went to Peru. You know? And since then, I lived there, and my life completely changed there. You know, I went through all these memories, and childhood, and countries, and all this mess, and suffering, and everything. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm, from all that... I'm here, and I do what I love, and I walk my spiritual path using sacred plants, and I live with people who love me and who I love. I mean, this is happiness. To me, it's the definition of happiness. And if happiness means something else, I'm not interested. 
Before the ceremony, Sergei recruits some of us to help him prepare the medicine, cracking the cactus into pieces. They are doing something that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I'm too tired, so... <laughs> well, they're basically uh, parting the big chunks of cactus that I was drying for a few weeks. And uh, this is what we're going to brew in a minute. Then some of it gets ground into a fine green powder so that it can be eaten. That's how you break and crush your fears yeah. and sickness and depression. That's oh, how you crush it. Yeah, I want to do crush this. crush it, you know. The majority of the cactus gets boiled and reboiled until it is in a thick, concentrated liquid ready for drinking. Can you see, tell me when it gets two liters. Two liters. Do you see? Uh, yeah, there. Two. Yeah. San Pedro is a post-colonial name. It's San Peter. And according to the biblical story, that was the guy who received key from heaven. The original name of this cactus, as it was known here for thousands of years, it's Huachuma, Huachuma which means vision. Shamanism, it's, it's the first religion of humankind. Through certain plants, you connect to spirits and you bring healing into your people, to your patient. For the Western mind, anything which is not seen with your eyes would be hard to believe in. So plant spirit might sound a little bit strange to somebody, but there are plant spirits, and this is experiential. This is not something you should trust me or somebody else. You just need to experience that for yourself what it is, because it's not describable. It's not enough to take medicine. It's not enough. You have to help people to guide them through that. I create environment, safe environment for people to relax and just to think about their life and finding their solutions to their problems. We drink the liquid in the morning when the ceremony begins, and then Sergei serves spoonfuls of booster powder doses in the afternoon. But each morning, as I sit there waiting for my turn to drink, I contemplate backing out. It's a terrifying proposition to have your ego shoved aside. But I journeyed too far to get here to back out now, and not just physically, spiritually and psychologically as well. So I drink my cup. In your mouth and wash it. Oh, God. The path has taken many turns. Almost a decade after my diagnosis, I left my doctors behind in Boston and settled down in Brooklyn where I met a rather unconventional therapist named Kati who helped me take a hard look into my psyche. After working with her for a year or two, when things began to get deep, I had the following dream. Kati was captaining a ship. I was on board, and we were at sea. In the middle of the night, she led me up to the top of the mast where there was a platform to stand on and a giant searchlight. She flicked the massive switch and shined the light at the sea, which illuminated and became as transparent as a swimming pool, and the aquatic life under the water these strange creatures of the deep. They became visible to me. Together we saw my own unconscious laid bare with fierce clarity. And then I dove in. And sometime shortly after this dream, I surfaced with some memories, like the time when I was five years old and had my first play date with a girl. As soon as she came over, I was so excited, I pulled down my shorts and underwear to my ankles and began laughing hysterically. But her mom, she didn't find this to be very funny, and so neither did mine. There was another memory. When I was 10, I was really bored at my Jewish day school. I never cared much for religious doctrine, and certainly not for the Talmud. So I wrote an expressive story in creative writing class about a lawyer who committed suicide. This again brought on the authorities. The school called my parents, and I had to see a shrink who had no clue how to talk to me. I perceived the whole thing as being terribly shameful. It's not that these incidences were so harmful in and of themselves. But they pointed to one big childhood takeaway. Do not reveal your real self. It's rotten and dangerous. Whatever you do, hide. Keep it all in. So my therapist and I had discovered this about me. That the me that presented myself to the world wasn't me. That the real me lay somewhere deeper inside. And that this might be playing a role in why I was still not healthy. This was an empowering discovery. But still, no matter what my therapist and I did, I wasn't able to lower my defenses, drop the facade, and become that Nathan that lay hidden inside of me. It was like Kati and I were digging, 
making strides for a few years. But then, boom, we hit a barrier. Or maybe it sounded more like this. Here, this guy is a professional. He can describe it better than me. I'm Neil Goldsmith. Um, I'm a psychologist here in New York City. I'm a psychotherapist. Neil says when we were born, we are all like a well with a glowing spring at the bottom. But through cultural conditioning, poor parenting, and various physical and emotional traumas, it's as though leaves fall into our wells and dry up and harden over our spring. So you go to a psychologist, and you're a psychiatrist. You say, listen, you know, I need some help. So he says, no problem, no problem. Let me get my pickaxe out. And he takes the pickaxe, and it's almost like, you know, uh, um, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote and in the cartoons. And he takes this pickaxe, and he says, he t puts it over his head, and he pulls it down at full strength, and he hits against the top of, the, of those dried, hardened leaves, and he goes, ping! And he tries again, ping! And a few sparks of, of concrete fly away. And he says, no problem. 20 years or so, we'll be down to the bottom of this. But Neil, as well as many other anthropologists and psychologists that I began reading in my quest for healing, all say there is a solution, or at least a shortcut, to getting around that bing sound. And that is psychedelics, entheogens, visionary plants. So with psychedelics, you know, it loosens, it softens. The leaves begin to fly away. And after a while, you can get in touch with that glow again, much more rapidly than without these substances. Getting in touch with the glow, that's what I needed. In the early 1990s, the U.S. government had uh, meetings deciding that they would now again treat psychedelics like they would any other new investigational research drug. And there's three wonderful studies being done at Johns Hopkins Medical School, NYU Medical School, and UCLA. These are uh, cancer patients generally who have had who have terminal diagnoses, who will have maybe six months to live. And in the room, in the last months of their lives, they take psilocybin in this gentle psychotherapeutic way. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in hallucinogenic mushrooms. The participants are placed in comfortable rooms, administered the proper dose, and rather than be guided by a shaman, they are guided by therapists. And the results have been extraordinarily positive. They um, come in touch with perfection, with their God, with the universe, with love. They release their anger. They seek rapprochement with their uh, estranged brother-in-law or the like, or their parents. They forgive. And they begin leading their lives for the last six months of their life rather than leading their deaths for the last six months of their lives. While Western medicine may be administering psychedelics for therapeutic purposes in the decades to come, they are not there yet. I gave NYU a call, but it was a no-go. You had to be dying to get into the study. And thankfully, I was very much alive. But I was suffering. I had to take 60 milligrams of extended release Adderall just to get out of bed or take a shit. I was also about to turn 30 and get married, and I wanted so desperately to be off drugs and healthy. In my early 20s, I had become a voracious reader of all things healing. I had read that there was a vine in the jungle called ayahuasca, which when combined with another plant allows the psychoactive ingredient DMT, dimethyltryptamine, also nicknamed the spirit molecule, to cross over the blood-brain barrier. This process allows one's body and mind to reorganize its neural network, thereby having healing potential for all sorts of mental and physical disorders. I had filed this away in the back of my mind, occasionally reading about people's experiences with the Vine in online forums, and never thinking that I would be bold enough for such a venture. But at this time in my life, when I was about to get married and still having symptoms from an illness that began back when I was 16, I just decided, fuck it. I'm not having a bachelor party. I'm having a bachelor sojourn. Healing exists for me, and I have to go find it. I don't need strippers. I need a completely different kind of female presence. I need ayahuasca, the great mother plant. I'm going to Peru. I just had to tell Shula, my wife-to-be. Do you remember when I told you that I was going to go to Peru because there was a hallucinogenic vine down there that I wanted to use for the purposes of my health? Why are you making that face? You have to ask open-ended questions. It's the first rule of being a journalist. You should start over. I rephrased. Do you remember how you felt? I remember you mentioning it sort of like vaguely that you were interested in it. I think you were sort of nervous to tell me that you were really going to go to Peru to do it because you knew I wouldn't be happy about it. I didn't have specific feelings about 
the vine itself necessarily, more the fact that you were going to be away for three weeks and in a country that, you know, on your own and you don't speak Spanish. Did you think it was uh, weird? No, not for you. <laughs> I don't, I mean, you've, you've tried a million sort of weird type of healing things. Shula may not have thought so, but I thought it was weird. I have undertaken a few bold ventures in my life beforehand, but this one had a more brazen flavor. I bought a plane ticket, flew into Lima, and hopped on an eight-hour bus ride north to the heart of the Andes where the retreat center was. Almost every evening for a week, 15 of us tourists would gather together in a big yurt in the pitch black at the foothills of the 20,000-foot snow-capped mountains with the shaman that had been bussed up from the Amazon jungle. I brought a recorder to one of the ceremonies. Hear that? That is me taking long, deep breaths as the shaman begins to sing the traditional ayahuasca chants called Icaros. Ayahuasca is a spiritual teacher, and like one of those old-school ruler-hitting teachers, she can be a little harsh. Except she doesn't use a ruler. She uses vomit. Like a snake shedding skins from the inside out, you purge those hard and stagnant layers of your psyche. Step by step, she closes down your story-spinning head and pries open your heart. It ain't easy. An hour after drinking the medicine at the first ceremony, a wave of severe nausea came at me. The problem was the vomit buckets they had handed us for just this situation were the exact same pink plastic ones they had given to me in the hospital. I couldn't do it. I couldn't re-enter that space. The whole ceremony I was sick, nauseous beyond belief, and I could not purge. But the next ceremony, I came armed with a plan. After the shaman poured my cup, I gestured for more until the cup was full, and the shaman and the entire room of people were laughing at me. That did it. That night, the puke and shit came flowing out of me both ends, black as oil, and I had a vision in which the ayahuasca vine was whispering to me, saying, This is chemotherapy. I had other visions, too, like about how alive a single plant or teaspoon of soil is, or how poorly we treat the earth. I filled an entire notebook with my experiences, but talking about it always feels cheesy. So I'll just say that these ceremonies provided a taste of exactly what Neil Goldsmith, the New York therapist, was articulating. The hardened leaves inside me were clearing, and at long last I was catching a glimpse of the spring in my well. When I got back home, I got married something I was initially very ambivalent about. So it was with great surprise that I absolutely loved my wedding. It was on a beautiful mountain in the Catskills, overlooking the Ashokan Reservoir, and I felt loved in a way that I thought I was too hardened and cynical of a man to feel. I believe that ayahuasca was very instrumental in this opening of my heart. Slowly, my chronic fatigue was resolved. I could poop again, and no more Adderall. I had a great year. I continued participating in ayahuasca ceremonies in the Peruvian Andes. After one of them, though, I headed south to Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley, where I got wind of a shaman who worked with a visionary plant called San Pedro. I didn't think I'd be able to talk to him, though, since, as my wife gently pointed out, I don't speak Spanish. But I figured, what the hell? I picked up a payphone in Cusco, and I gave him a call. That was the first time I spoke to Sergei. To my pleasant surprise, his English seemed pretty good, we arranged to meet at the bus station in the town square of Culca, where he lived. While we were introducing ourselves, sizing each other up, and working out the logistics of doing a ceremony, he asked that we convene later because he had to pick up his daughter at kindergarten. Only, he didn't say kindergarten. He said gan, and my ears did a double take. Gan in Hebrew means garden and is short for kindergarten. Had this Peruvian shaman just spoken Hebrew to me? Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. Yeah, that's strange, because it's a kindergarten, which somehow I said gone without even... I didn't speak Hebrew for like 15 years now. I thought I'm Peruvian, that's right. I said, no, I'm Russian Jew. Having made this connection, Sergei moved around his schedule so he could guide me in a ceremony the following day. It was a beautiful, lovely encounter, and by the time it was over, I had a tremendous sense of trust in this man. It wasn't just our similar backgrounds. There was something else that made him feel like a brother to me. And I think it had to do with the fact that he too once found himself close to death. It didn't happen in a hospital room, though. It happened in a desert, under a night sky, after drinking peyote. Can you talk about the story of, was it a rattlesnake or a scorpion? Scorpions. 
Yes. Can you tell the story of the scorpions? Uh, sure. In Peru, I was working with uh, Sacred Cactus San Pedro, also known as Huachuma. And at the same time, I was going to Mexico working with another sacred cactus, which is called Peyote. Sergei had met some Indian shamans in Mexico and was invited to take part in a series of peyote ceremonies in the middle of the desert. They all drank the peyote and were sitting together on mats on the desert floor when Sergei felt something out of the ordinary. And it was not a hallucination. It was a sting. Two stings, in fact. I didn't see the scorpions. They were crawling under my pants. And this is when I felt stings on both thighs, like an inch below my genitals. And I jumped off my mat and I started to panic. The scorpions in that part of Mexico are notoriously deadly. So the shaman I was with said, well, don't panic. You will make it worse. Just try to keep calm. There was nothing the shaman could do to get the venom out, and Sergei's body began shutting down. The scorpions, their venom is neurotoxin. It targets your nervous system and shuts the whole body down, including all your breathing organs, like lungs and all the muscles that move there. So first you choke. You can breathe. You can move a finger. You can open your eyes. You can talk. Absolutely, you don't have saliva, nothing. Everything is dry. Pain and itching and burning. And you just want to get out of your body. You just want to be outside of it, but you can't. You are totally chained into it. You can feel like your soul actually getting frozen and ready to leave your body. Did you think you were going to die that night? To be honest, I don't remember that thought. But I do remember laying down and thinking the whole thing can end to me like this. It was very sad to die. That's the feeling I remember. I realized how much I love life. And I only started to walk my path and here I am, (laughs) dying. And uh, out of this uh, love to life, I actually push the death back. And of course, the great medicine of peyote helped me on a physical level. Without the medicine, I would be dead for sure. Because it blocked the venom from killing my liver. As I see it now, I mean, eight years later, this is what they call the rite of passage. So I feel sanctioned by that experience to do what I do. I'm stumbling now around the lake, looking for a place to get comfortable while trying to operate my audio recorder. Not an easy feat when you are deep in the medicine. Oh man, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to work this thing. (laughs) So we took the medicine like three hours ago. I'm just feeling really warm, light. (sighs) So glad to be here. But the warm feeling didn't last. I was sitting by the lake when I started to feel my health problems. The severe bloating in my stomach, the terrible pains in my neck, and then my mind started yelling at me. What's wrong with you, Nathan? Why did you get cancer? Why do you keep making yourself sick? Why are you even having these thoughts? It's beautiful and peaceful here, and you're a head full of terrible noise. Why can't you relax? What the fuck is the matter with you? At this point, I gave up. I needed help. So I went looking for Sergei. Thankfully, he hovers nearby precisely for moments like this. I just wanted to ask you about, I started getting really anxious. Yeah, well, man, you all the time getting anxious. I know. <laughs> I mean, what are you anxious about? You okay? I know I'm okay, but I just started like... Like how, how it's anxious? Explain me. My mind starts going like a million thoughts a second, and I can't Thinking turn about it. what? I don't know. What like, mean, I'm not comfortable. It's just a sensation of not being comfortable. How do you feel? It's a sensation of yeah. not being comfortable? Yeah. With yourself? Yeah. Man. <laughs> 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 I, what? That's something totally new for you? You've never heard of that? people being that way? I remember it took Sergey a minute to understand where I was coming from. Well, it's a little, a little extreme, I would say, you know. I mean, I can... <laughs> but in the process of explaining my state of being, he got me to laugh at myself, which was a huge relief. And then he was able to say something that would be a big take-home for me. 
and something I really needed to hear. Well, yeah. You need to start accepting yourself who you are. I think this is where it is. I think this is this is it. I think this is the healing to start accepting yourself as you are, as you are, with all your problems, with all your defects. If you have some, if that's how you see it. You know, if what if. If all that crap that you have inside, you know, it's okay. It's you. You know, nobody is perfect. Everybody have problem. I'm full of my, you know, stuff too. You know, so it's okay. I accept myself. I want to be a good person, but I want to be me first. So you know, you have to be you. You have to want to be you. I mean, this is serious soul healing. As the ceremonies wound down and day turned to night, we drummed, and feeling unguarded, light, and energized, even I was on my feet. Listen, that's me chanting into the night. When I ventured back home to my wife and two cats, I was radiant. <laughs> and amidst this glow, I decided to take on a new challenge. I enrolled in a four-year therapist training program at the Gestalt Center for Psychotherapy and Training in New York, beginning to dream of my own version of Sergei's path, Nathan's path. Perhaps it is not set in the Sacred Valley in Peru, serving hallucinogenic cactus, but maybe in the Hudson Valley as a therapist, allowing my life's challenges to inform my practice. The radiance of Sergei's retreats wears off quickly for me. While I've mostly healed the constipation and fatigue and feel my heart has been opened and my spirit awakened, for mysterious reasons my stomach is severely distended and I am having numbness, lightheadedness, and balance issues to the point where it can be incredibly difficult to go to work and to go to school. We think maybe it's a nerve thing. Is that the sound of my nerves? So I keep on going to appointments, having blood tests. Are you ready? Yep. Which arm do you want to draw? Like a fist? And attending ayahuasca ceremonies whenever I can. I have tried Western medicine, Eastern medicine, but it's the medicine of the South, shamanic medicine which despite or in spite of my difficulty and suffering, has fanned an ember of hope into a burning flame. And that glowing, emanating heat reminds me that healing is out there for me, or perhaps in there, lying dormant deep inside, right on the verge of being unleashed. Nathan Ehrlich. Nathan's a multimedia journalist from Brooklyn, New York. He's currently working on a young adult novel, which is told from the perspective of a teenage boy undergoing cancer treatment. Sound design, mixing, and original scoring for that story by Aaron Leader. Thanks also to Michael Reed for additional sound recording. Sergei Baranov lives in Peru, in the sacred valley of the Incas. Check out his website, shamansworld.org, or order his book called Path on Amazon. And that's our episode. If you're new to the show, you can catch up on all our previous episodes. Just search for Israel Story on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of the other main podcast platforms. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all under Israel Story. Now, in case you haven't heard, we're looking for a sponsor. That lucky company or organization that doesn't know it yet, but is about to become the next MailChimp or Stamps.com. So if you want to support our show and reach a dedicated and rapidly growing audience, email us at sponsor at prx.org. Israel Story is brought to you by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is produced in partnership with Tablet Magazine. Go to tabletmag.com slash Israel Story to hear all our previous episodes. Our staff includes Yochai Meital, Shai Satran, Roy Gilron, Maya Kosover, Shoshi Shmulovitz, and... For the very last time, Benny Becker. 
Benny started off here at Israel Story as one half of our very first cohort of interns. He then became part of the staff, and now, after producing countless wonderful stories and pulling an even greater number of all-nighters, he's moving to the Appalachian Mountains in eastern Kentucky, where he'll be reporting for the community radio station WMMT and for the brand new Ohio River Network. You guys are really lucky to get Benny, and we will miss you very, very much. Rachel Fisher and Sophie Shore are wonderful production interns. Our executive producer is Julie Subrin. I'm Mishi Harman, and we'll be back in two weeks with a new episode of Israel Story. Till then, yalla bye.